Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Spring 2020 Ethics and Leadership Panel, Identity in our, our Architectural Narrative. I'm Jennifer Asselstein, the Undergraduate Director for the School of Architecture. I'm going to be moderating the panel today due to unexpected events that required Mimi Sullivan to be elsewhere this morning. Another change to our panel is that Samina Satopkin cannot present today as a panelist due to the changing COVID-19 situation. I know you can all um, probably have empathy for um, the fact that we are, our lives are changing on a daily basis. Samina is fine and she may even be in our online audience today. So I do hope that if she has thoughts to contribute to our session, that she will join us less formally in the second half of the discussion during our Q and A. I welcome you all to the first to this very first experience for us as the ethics and leadership panel transitions to a fully line, fully online webinar from our previous in person audience at 601 Brandon when we had video streaming. Um, this theme today is really important and I've actually been think, considering how it reflects on the on the moment that we're in as we watch the virus uh, move across the United States and around the globe. In previous ethics and leadership panels, there's always been this very consistent underlying, underlying thread that can be summed up with the idea that who you are influences who you become as an architect. And today this discussion brings that, which has been only inferred, to the forefront. We're gonna ask our guests today to reflect on the question, how can who we are shape our creative and professional path? Given the critical moment in history that we're experiencing with COVID-19, I would add that who we are is the sum total of our experiences. This moment in time will shape us and shift us. We'll be asked to draw deeply from our resources and craft a plan of action for our lives. As architects and designers, the process of reflection, defining the problem, decision-making, seeking clarity, and including others with our, through the skills of visual and physical making is exactly what we are prepared to do. So as our profession becomes more diverse and more young architects enter the profession from varied backgrounds, we reflect on how our previous experience are, will shape our values and character and will also impact our professional choices and actions. Our panelists will reveal how their identity has shaped how they think about their academic and professional roles. Helen Bronston, associate at Smith Group and Charles Green, founder of Atelier Silitz, will bring their quite diverse backgrounds and professional roles to generate a thoughtful and, per and personal discussion encompassing race, gender, sexual, and cultural identity. So as the panelists are talking, we really encourage you as participants to type into the chat box any questions and comments you have. It's really, I think, very um, important that if you hear something that resonates with your own experience and you can briefly share it in the chat pod, I'd really like to hear from you. I personally would really like to hear from you. And, um, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be a question. It can be a comment. Karen Song, our undergraduate assistant director, is going to be watching the chats for comments and sharing them in the second half of the discussion. Uh, we have one other option for you, and that is if you'd like to speak and if you are um, connected through a computer audio, you can raise your hand um, through the chat pod and we can actually um, turn on your microphone uh, at a later point in time. So that all of that can happen in the last third of the, of the event today. Um, I do want to hear your voices if you have good audio connection. I think hearing your voices is actually a really um, important aspect of um, why we gather for this ethics and leadership panel. Um, and we also want to hear your questions. You don't have to speak up if you would prefer to just type them in. Uh, all the questions that I have for the panel are actually generated by students themselves. So I want you to know that um, this has all come from our student body. The group of students who helped me craft these, pan these panel questions actually came from our fourth year studio. So with that, I want to introduce very briefly our two panelists today. And um, the first one is Charles Green, founder of Atelier Silets Architecture and AS Development. Charles is the founder of Atelier Silets Architecture and AS Development, an interdisciplinary firm operating at the intersection of architecture, community, and social equity. 
Charles is a registered architect in California and Oregon pre and previously worked at San Luis Sadowitz at Natoma Architects in San Francisco. He received his Master of Architecture from UC Berkeley, where he was the recipient of the Malcolm Reynolds Memorial Fellowship. He's recently joined the AAU faculty and is teaching third year online students. I hope some of his students are here from ARH 350. His interest in, his interest in architecture design and development stems from his passion for, through societal inclusion. Charles is a Native American tribal member from the Silas tribe in Oregon. Through his cultural upbringing, he realized the inequity that exists for many people throughout our society. With a passion to make a positive social impact through design, Charles founded Atelier Silas to help underserved communities become stakeholders in their own neighborhood by teaching people how to invest and develop their own architecture. They create value, income, and affordability that benefits their families and communities for multiple generations. The Atelier Silas team works alongside these community members throughout the entire process, including planning, financial sourcing, architecture, and construction. Helen Bronston, our second presenter today, is the Architecture Discipline Lead and Associate at Smith Group in San Francisco. For those of you who don't know, Smith Group is a national firm um, and they have many offices throughout the, throughout the United States and I wouldn't be surprised if they're also abroad. Helen is an accomplished technical architect and an award-winning designer whose careers included civic, educational research, housing, and healthcare projects. Most of this work has been nonprofit or governmental projects where she has felt she could do the, excuse me, do the most good in the world. Helen was raised in the Midwestern US, educated in New England, and has lived in California since 1994. Convinced that the present was not intelligible without an understanding of the past, she is pursuing a PhD at UC Berkeley in the history of architecture, writing about the development of infrastructure and commercial architecture in early modern London. Midway through her degree and while working as an architect, Helen had a crisis of self, which she resolved by transitioning genders. A trans view has been part of Helen's work and thinking since childhood. This is reflected in her interest in anthropology, where she has sought alternatives to the society and culture around her, and in her work where she creates alternative and empowering viewpoints that enable projects to solve complex problems and surpass her clients' expectations. With that, I welcome both Charles and Helen, and Charles will share his screen and start his presentation. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Jennifer and Mimi for inviting me to be on this uh, panel, and I'm excited to share my ongoing journey through architecture with everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so just I'll start off with a little bit about myself and my uh, personal history. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I am Native American from a tribe in Siletz, Oregon. And for me, growing up, um, my family wasn't wealthy, and I didn't have, I think, some of the privileges that maybe other kids my age had. But one thing that I did have and I am most thankful for in my life is the sense of community. Uh, that comes from the culture of being Native American. Uh, Native Americans, they, tribal, different tribal members, they take care of one another, um, regardless of what stage of life uh, they're in, whether they're a baby or whether they're an elder. And so um, because of my tribe, they supported me to pursue higher education. And I, I can't thank them enough, and I wouldn't have been able to um, accomplish getting my bachelor's and master's degree without them. <clears throat> and so because they helped me achieve this for my master's of architecture uh, thesis project, I designed a project that was a homage and tribute to the culture and community that is Silets, um, while at the same time trying to make a positive uh, impact on um, current uh, Native American identity and culture. So the thesis really began looking at the identity of uh, the Siletz tribe, looking at the history, 
looking at craft and ways of making and looking at um, various aspects of uh, culture and gathering and living. So the project is a dialogue between, um, as I said, culture, craft and uh, tradition, looking at dwelling, site, and various uh, details uh, that are part of that craft and tradition, and then a material system or a material language. Being uh, a tribe from the Pacific Northwest, um, there is a lot of wood readily available, specifically cedar. So it, it looks at um, various aspects of um, using this material and in um, both traditional, contemporary um, reuse and, and even growth. So I looked at several ways of making um, uh, in terms of the, the history of craft. First was the bow with time tensioning wood where they would wet the wood and then they would use some sort of uh, straps or, or, or ties to, to bend it in certain ways. I looked at how uh, they used the carving of wood to create flutes. Uh, the weaving of wood strands and fibers to create various uh, baskets used for collecting water. And then even the scraps and remnants, nothing, nothing got wasted. So they would use um, the, the scraps to create tinder bundles to create fire. In terms of in looking at the, the history of the architecture, um, as I said, the, it's a tribe from the Pacific Northwest, so they didn't live in teepees. Uh, as cedar is relative, readily available, they created these long houses called plank houses. And these uh, structures were just very long, thin clad cedar structures where um, at atop the structures they would have um, uh, fish hanging structures for drying and smoking salmon. And on the interior, um, the center of the house was always used for communal gathering. Multiple families, multiple generations would live here. The walls became very thick and they became the sleeping quarters for uh, various families. Uh, another thing to note is they would also help each other build each other's house. So maybe there would be uh, an entire generation in, in one house and that uh, family would help another family build their plank house. So the idea of community has really been a part of the culture from the beginning. These are kind of just some plan analysis looking at kind of the, the center for communal gathering and then these kind of thickened walls where, where uh, the dwelling and sleeping occurred. This is the this is the town of Solets. It's in the it's on the central Oregon coast, uh, about like two and a half hours away from Portland, Oregon. And there's a river that runs around the entire site, and it, it's very small. You could drive from one end to the other in about five minutes. Um, all of the gray properties and the brown property are are, are uh, sites that are owned currently by the tribe, and that's where a lot of the tribal members are housed that live in Solets. Um, and ultimately, I chose this, the brown uh, site um, next to the river for where I placed the architecture. So what's currently happening, though, um, around the nation and specifically in Select is there's a lack of culture and a loss of place and a lack of identity. And many students or uh, many, sorry, many tribal members, they live in subpar conditions, uh, trailers, some people are living out of uh, their cars, and many of them are looking for some sort of uh, low cost sustainable housing. But um, I think due to economics, many of them are on uh, waiting list. Um, I spoke with several tribal members during my tribal research and it was kind of a ongoing theme. And then, so just kind of driving around Solets and looking at it, it looks kind of generic. It's, uh, there's, there's no identity. Like these buildings, a lot of them could be in any, any place across the United States. So as I began to uh, speculate on how to create an architecture from all of this research, I wanted to look at the traditional ways of making contemporary ways of making, and then maybe hybrids between uh, old and new ways of making. So I decided to focus my areas of exploration <clears throat> in three areas. One was the fish hanging structures that are above the roof, um, the, the traditional plank uh, roof and, and walls, and then these interior walls um, that uh, sometimes have these very beautiful woven um, 
maps. <clears throat> so one thing that became apparent uh, right from the beginning is I wanted to create a house or housing that was flexible and adaptable. So movement really became a part of the thesis where it would have all of the current accommodations of a house, kitchen, bathroom, things like that, but it could be opened up or closed up to, create, to accommodate program like powwows and dancing and the communal gathering that used to happen. So these are kind of just some low tech methods looking at movement. <clears throat> then I looked at some higher tech, um, uh, I guess, construction methods of creating a kit of parts and maybe combining those to create some sort of uh, movement and then starting to look at hybrid ways where maybe you take CNC or laser cut pieces and, and then you combine that with like weaving or the time tensioning of wood. Uh, this is just kind of another uh, assembly that, that I created where I, I time tensioned wood and then combined it with a, a series of uh, laser cut components. And then even looking at how to expand on wood uh, even further and looking at 3D printed wood to create joints, um, to create movement. Um, so this is the material that is um, half, half wood pulp and half plastic. You can see it can, uh, it can, it can be used to create uh, joints and there's this kind of uh, beautiful kind of texture that comes with it. <clears throat> so then as I uh, started to design the house, I started to think about the entire life cycle and production of the house, both from uh, the raw material uh, through the, the dwelling. So first off, I guess the way I was thinking about it, the tribe uh, currently owns timberlands and a lot of that wood gets sent to uh, uh, processing facilities and the wood gets sold off. If a portion of that wood could be retained, it could be used to create the house and the various uh, types of details. If, if uh, one of the byproducts that comes from processing wood is a lot of pulp, wood pulp, and that wood gets sold a majority of the time to paper companies. If that pulp could be retained, it could be used to create other uh, wood composites uh, or, or wood materials, such as the 3D printed material I was exploring. All of these materials uh, and processed um, woods could get delivered to the site and it could be a communal event, similar to how they used to help each other build e uh, each other's houses. Uh, you could have kids there and different tribal members there learning about all the different new and old fabrication uh, and construction techniques. This is a kind of plan view of the house. Um, you can see the walls have become kind of thickened uh, in various places to accommodate different program. Uh, this wall is kind of holding a canoe. Um, there's various beds and, and doors that fold in and out, uh, bathroom, kitchen, uh, stair that folds down to get onto the roof. This is a kind of axon view of the, of the wall. Um, and you can see the kind of various things that fold in and out. Uh, one thing, these walls, I, I, um, the, the intent was for them to be 3D printed and use the joints that I was looking at to create them. And, um, and there's a transparency that, that comes from that material since it's mixed with plastic. These are kind of just looking at uh, the traditional details, which I, I reused for the cedar strap ties for the fish hanging structures, the 3D printed uh, joints, and then uh, a combined time tension and uh, kind of CNC um, detail to create a, um, a water collection screen. As I said, the material has some transparency to it. So depending on the program and the wall, how opened or closed it is, it can create varying levels of transparency throughout the house. Uh, and then just here's a few um, 3D images of the house. Uh, this is the approach. You can kind of see the fish hanging structures. Uh, this is the house on the inside when it's all closed up, uh, kind of transparency coming from, from one side and more solid when it's closed up. And as I said, it could be used for dances or powwows, communal gathering. Uh, but then it also, uh, it's a little dark on my screen, but it, um, so the program on the inside is opened up. You can see that the program, uh, the walls are kind of holding the boat, the screen. Yeah, and then here's a kind of final model uh, that was produced. And the final model was a sectional model and opened up as well. Um, so 
From th this pro this project is is an ongoing project for me. I have um, I'm I've talked to my tribe several times about uh, pursuing a project like this, and um, I haven't made any traction yet, uh, mostly due to uh, financial concerns. But I'm constantly in conversation with them about creating some sort of affordable housing that also relates to the history and the identity of Celets. After my thesis, I, as Jennifer mentioned, I began working for uh, Stanley Sadowitz, uh, Natoma Architects in San Francisco. And during my time there, I, I learned a lot. I, I learned the technical aspects, a lot of technical aspects of architecture. I learned um, how an office is ran and uh, to some degree, even the economics of a project. Um, I did work for various kind of uh, wealthy individual clients and real estate developers. But I think the project that was most memorable to me is a nonprofit water tank um, library that we did in Kenya, where we reused an old uh, water tank, this old concrete water tank, to create a new library for the Mithuini Primary School. Their current or their previous library was a uh, just a, a closet essentially. Um, and the economics of this project uh, was the, the major, uh, one of the major driving factors. Uh, they had these kind of um, louver windows, and, and that was the kind of design constraint that we had to work with. And they only had, uh, they have steel readily available. So they had this catalog of steel where they only had maybe like 10 to 12 components of steel. So the entire project became based around that. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this project. But here's some kind of construction photos. They're kind of redoing the inside of the water tank. Um, they're starting to uh, construct the steel, welding the steel roof. Uh, we had a steel spiral stair uh, that, that went down into the uh, bottom part of the library. Um, and then we even used the, um, the columns to become the bookshelves. Uh, it was the best project in terms of construction administration that I've ever done, just because I was able to interact with uh, these students as the building was being built, and they were getting more and more excited that they um, that a new library was being built for them. Um, and then when the project opened, we had a kind of uh, opening community uh, event where all the all the parents and students came. Um, and then here's some uh, images uh, with the students and, and their new library. Yep. So I think after I did this project um, with Stanley, I, I shortly uh, after that went out onto my own because I think after doing this, it reinvigorated my passion for doing architecture that makes an impact in people's lives. Um, so with that, I, I founded my, my own architecture uh, office, Atelier Celette's Architecture. And um, through that, it's, it's, it's been good, but running an architecture office is, is a, a difficult thing. And I guess I started to notice that I didn't have as much agency as I wanted to, to make the impact that I wanted to. So as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we're an interdisciplinary uh, company. We're actually several different companies, but Primarily, we are an architecture company, but my, uh, my company is, is uh, beginning to expand further and further every day. Um, and basically, yeah, we, we have a community engagement arm, we have our development arm, and basically we say that we want to do whatever it takes to basically make the best possible architecture and impact uh, in our communities. So a lot of the times, um, I'm not just acting as the architect, I'm acting as a community member and I'm trying to engage with, uh, you know, various community members and understand what their needs and their wants are. I also have to, uh, I've taken on the role of functioning as the developer where I've learned a lot about how the economics and finances of a project work. And the reason I have done this is because I, I want to be able to control as much as the process as possible to have the best possible outcome. I don't want to have a client tell me that we can't do this for the community because of X, Y, Z. So the, I'll just quickly talk about a project that, that uh, we have right now, which is Uncle Willie's uh, Barbecue. 
And I met uh, Uncle Willie and his son, Craig, who are over here on the right, um, at a presentation that I had done in Oakland. And they told, at the presentation, they had told me like, hey, you know, our property is in downtown Oakland and uh, it's just this little building and we are getting approached by a lot of huge real estate developers to get bought out and pushed out of Oakland. Would you be interested in helping us develop our property? This is their, their building on the right. And, and I said, yeah, sure. And I, I took a look at their project. I, I, I looked at a, a lot of finances and various programs that could go there. Um, and so, you know, I, I threw this in because uh, I, I wanted to show the students that, you know, sketching is really important. And so these are kind of just some initial sketches I had done looking at, you know, what, what we could fit on the site, what type of program would be there, what the elevation uh, along the street could be, and how do you create um, an economy from something where, you know, we want to create something that um, is efficient, but also creates beautiful architecture. So, um, you know, we're at, the be we're at the beginning kind of schematic design uh, phase of this project right now. But um, basically what we're doing for the family is we are building 28 units um, uh, above and we are rebuilding their, um, their barbecue restaurant on the ground floor. And because I'm the developer, I can control the way I want the project to go. So rather than someone coming in and buying these people out, or maybe giving them a small percentage of ownership. The way I have this entire project structured is once the project is complete, uh, once the investors and everyone's paid out, uh, I'm getting out of the project, the investors are getting out of the project, and this family will continue to own this project for, uh, for the rest of their lives. And, and it could be something that they pass on to their kids. And so they'll be able to run their barbecue restaurant and uh, receive income from the residential units above um, thirty percent of the units will be uh, affordable housing, um, but I think more so the focus of the project is creating affordability for the family because especially during these times with covid nineteen they're having trouble right now running their business and being able to pay for um, the mortgage on their on their building so this is kind of um, an initial rendering we've done for the for the project and um, yeah, we're at the beginning stages of this, but I'm really excited for this and I'm, I'm excited to be helping them uh, kind of create their own architecture and own their neighborhood rather than uh, some outside uh, investor or developer owning their neighborhood. Um, and so this is a model that um, I've implemented across a lot of projects. So we have five other projects that are all at varying stages in our office. These are all in Oakland, uh, these five projects. Um, and they're all kind of doing the same thing where we are partnering with um, uh, local property owners and local community members um, to try to help them not get pushed out of uh, the place that they love and live. So, yeah, with that, I, I just included my, um, you know, if anyone wants to uh, email me or has any further questions, you can always, um, I'm always around. <laughs> Hey, I guess uh, this is Helen. I guess I'm supposed to share my screen and I'm still not sure. I, suddenly it's become, there it is, share screen. Excuse me. Yeah. There we go. Okay. This is gonna be a little bit different story. I am um, speaking about somebody who uh, I guess felt like an outsider on the inside for most of my life. Um, and now I'm trying to be an outsider on the outside but still working on the inside. Um, so uh, for Charles, is, Charles was very um, clear about his uh, sense of identity as being part of a community as a child and growing up. And I, um, I was aware that I was part of a community as well, but I was also aware that I didn't fit in. And um, that emerges in a different, in a different cre creates a different trajectory for me. Um, I'm going to just go through a little bit of my, sort of my best, if you know the talking heads. So I asked myself, how did I get here? Um, I'm from the upper Midwest. I'm from Wisconsin, mostly. Um, in Wisconsin, you do a lot of things like uh, fish and play in the snow because there's a lot of fish and there's a lot of snow. It's known for its dairy farms. It's known for 
not much in the way of architecture, except of course for Frank Lloyd Wright, who is the local hero and is like the only American architect that most people who don't study architecture know. Um, so there's an inter interesting sort of uh, mix of sort of the pastoral and the progressive in the state. And um, I think that rubbed off on me. You can't tell it from this initial building. This is the first thing I ever built, which is a shed in my parents' backyard back in about 19. 78 or so. I've been in the architecture business for a long time. Um, in 1979, uh, my parents, who were pretty well off for Wisconsin, um, decided that I should look at maybe moving from Wisconsin schools to private schools. So um, I invested, investigated a bunch and uh, I went off to Phillips Exeter Academy in my sophomore year of high school. Um, Exeter is in New Hampshire, so I left, left my home state in the middle of my uh, formative years and moved away uh, to a very different pressure cooker, um, high achieving, but also high possibility environment that was quite different from where I was growing up. Um, one of the things that Exeter was known for and still is, is the uh, Harkness table teaching, which I didn't really quite realize it at the time, but looking back on it, it was really one of my first lessons in sort of spatial awareness for how, how space and the arrangement of people affects how thing, how out, affects outcomes. Um, in this case, the Harkness table teaches students at, a, at an oval table instead of in the typical American high school classroom, which is usually in rows of tablet arm tables. Um, this just creates a very different dynamic and a different way of learning. And you'll see that in the future and some of the work I've been working on. Exeter, of course, is also known as being one of the centers of uh, Kahn interest in this country because Louis I. Kahn designed their library in 1972. And I had the privilege of growing up uh, through my high school years, reading, working, uh, living in that library and its wonderful spaces, both for individuals and for gathering, the cons are definitely included. Um, and that's, been a, that's affected my entire life. Um, so this is me in about 1978, 79, somewhere in there in high school. Um, as I said, I'd felt like an outsider the whole time and how I felt like an outsider was that I'd never really felt male the entire time I'd been growing up. I'd been assigned male at birth. I was told by my parents that I was a boy. I did my darndest to prove to everybody that I was a boy. Um, I wasn't terribly macho or anything, but I tried to fit in. At the same time, this was grinding on me um, as being something that didn't work. Um, there wasn't a lot of option though for doing anything else. And so I just uh, thought, well, okay, I'm gonna just keep going. This, the uh, early 80s, the late 70s were not where a time of increasing awareness of gay and lesbian uh, members of the community, but it wasn't a great time to be trans. Um, it was still, uh, it was, and I don't know that present time is great either, but it certainly improved things. But back then, um, being trans was still certainly an object of ridicule. Um, I went to Yale after I finished Exeter, um, more privilege in, in evidence here. Um, I went there, also a site of several great Lewis Kahn buildings, the British Ar Architecture Museum and his Yale Art Gallery from a few years earlier. Um, this is a hotbed of Gothic <laughs> architecture, but of course that Gothic was all built in the 30s. So I also became aware of the idea that you know, time is a bit flexible when it comes to architecture, what you express and how you choose to express it isn't just about the time you're in, but about the choices you make. Um, back in 1982, Yale had its first Gay and Lesbian Awareness Days. If you're used to the usual acronym of you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, bisexuals and transgender people were nowhere on the radar. Um, and that was a, uh, you know, I, I saw, well, okay, there's people being liberated in their sexual minorities, but how about gender minorities? That wasn't there. And this is an article from Ann Landers at about the same time, who was an American gossip columnist or, or uh, advice columnist, excuse me, who um, kind of summed up the attitudes, you know, that people were phonies, people at Yale like to be phonies, that blowing your cover as a trans person who says they're and not taking this person seriously. It was, it was, this is just very typical of the attitudes. So I stayed in the closet. I stayed pretty deeply in the closet. Um, I had a Fulbright in Frankfurt finishing college. Um, I went to a very different place, a very different city in Germany. Um, spent a lot of my time traveling, visiting uh, architecture in different places. Um, I was actually a student of anthropology in college. I studied anthropology because it made me aware of 
uh, a larger world beyond the one I was in and offered also the awareness of possibilities for difference in life. Um, it was never clear to me that, uh, I never wanted to accept, let's put it that way, that the world I had was the world that had to be as I wasn't fitting in well. Um, I spent, what you're actually looking at here, does we back up a second, um, while I was in Frankfurt and having had this experience of all this, uh, all these con buildings and also having taken a great architectural history class at Yale from Lewis, uh, from um, Vincent Scully, I was suddenly convinced that what I really wanted to do was become an architect. Um, I had had enough of reading, I'd had enough of writing, I'd had enough of uh, academic thinking that was not applied in the world and I wanted to get out and do something. Um, I was doing a lot of writing at the time and um, thinking and casting about trying to figure out what to do. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, uh, complained to me as we wrote letters back and forth to each other from Europe. Um, she said, stop talking to me about what you're thinking of doing. I can't take all this <laughs> wishy-washy decision making. You've got to make a choice, figure something out, but do it on your own time. So I sort of did that and I decided I would apply to architecture school. And these pages and the two prior are actually from my architecture portfolio that I applied to graduate school with. Um, it was all done on a copier in a very cheap copy, copy shop in Frankfurt. And I got in against students who'd also put together, you know, very beautiful portfolios as students do these days. Um, I was told by the faculty, they took a flyer on me and luckily it paid off. But here I am in 1985 in Frankfurt, um, sat for a long time in the Cologne Cathedral. I remember writing some things in the Cologne Cathedral about being trans, about how this was, had, was part of me and yet I could not get rid of it. Um, and that I couldn't also live and I remember tearing that up and throwing it away in a trash can in the plaza outside. That was the first time I ever wrote anything about this. From there, I went to Harvard. Um, somehow I got into Harvard's architecture school. Um, I did some goofy looking projects like this uh, bunch of palm trees. That was the first thing I did. We did the usual sort of spread of, of interesting projects of housing and uh, performance spaces and commercial spaces. I uh, did a thesis, um, which starts to get at some of the things that I talked about that I think resonate throughout my career. And I'll just point to a couple of points. This, the thesis ended up being two insertions into a, um, a block on Beacon Hill in Boston. Beacon Hill is made up of very solid brick buildings in these sort of tubes of space that are brick. Um, and they sit cheek by jowl and there's a space in between sometimes for things to happen. And I was trying to create new community spaces inside of this very rigid structure. Um, and the thing that, one of the things that stuck with me is that the thesis said, this thesis must be about actually making architecture and must also discuss the building and its effects as they exist in the world, not as intellectual constructs alone. A lot of my work had been very intellectual up to then. All the functions of life and their interrelations in a particular spot. Radical inclusion, how can I allow unforeseen possibilities and idiosyncratic expressions? A building ought to be open. These were the kinds of things I was thinking, even while I was really unwilling to say I was trans, and while I was trying to say that the world had to change for me, I had to change as much as the world had to. Um, this is me graduating from Harvard in 1990. Um, a couple things I did coming out of that with my background in uh, higher in, in fancy education, let's put it that way, was um, I edited one an issue of the Harvard Architecture Review. And then I went to Ellen Swig. I got out in 1990, the economy was so-so. I took the first job that was offered to me and this was with a laboratory and educational design um, firm in Boston called Ellen Swig. They're still in practice, they do some great work. Um, and that's how I ended up in sort of the healthcare and laboratory gig. And this was the first project I worked on was for the Joslin Diabetes Center. It actually won an AIA award <laughs> that year, national. It's the only one I've ever been involved with, but I was very proud of it. Um, this was um, sort of a, my first step into seeing institutional work as being potentially something that was of uh, public good. I had come through a lot of institutions that served um, a public good or claim to. Admittedly, they were often problematic, but um, that's sort of where, it's, where I was comfortable and where I could fit in pretty well. Um, I learned laboratory design, working on uh, projects at Children's Hill Hospital of Philadelphia and some others. I moved to Coleman, McKinnell and Wood, um, a Boston firm known for the Boston uh, 
City Hall, if you remember that project, it looks kind of like a Corbusier project. Um, worked on this electrical engineering building, learned AutoCAD through all of this, and started out in school, of course, doing drafting and still drafted up until the 19, until like almost 2000, I was still doing a lot of drafting. Um, this is the first 3D work I did for the University of Colorado Hospital. Um, once I did this, I think they set up and took notice of me when I moved to Smith Group or to Stone Mary Cheney Patterson in San Francisco and said, hey, I guess you could maybe design some things. So I got to work on UCSF Mount Zion's outpatient uh, cancer facility. This is at the corner of Sutter and Divisadero in San Francisco, won a couple of national awards um, and tried to fit into the neighborhood. Um, kind of recalling some of the interests I had when I was in school on my thesis. A lot of the issues, a lot of the things you think about will stick with you over time. Worked on buildings for a genomic sciences facility at the University of California while Stone Maricini Patterson was purchased by another firm, became part of Smith Group, um, the Davis Project in Construction. At Smith Group, we had a little bit greater reach and greater resources. So I worked on a project for the Motion Picture and Television Fund in LA called the Saban Center for Health and Wellness. Um, as well as honed a lot of technical skills. This is um, drawings I did. One of my favorite drawing sheets of all time for my work is this drawing at the, for the UCSF Genentech Hall, which is in Mission Bay, laying out all the wood detailing for the interior and also of a special um, uh, display board of whiteboard and, and marker board. Architectural practice, as I perceived it in the 90s, was very male, it was historically very male and very conformist. It felt like that in school. And I don't know if you remember the picture of all of us with our black hats, but it was, uh, it felt, it felt very conformist, even though I knew it wasn't. I knew I had lots of friends who were gay. I had friends who were, who were crazy. I had, I mean, in good ways, <laughs> in ways that were productive. I had friends that had mental health difficulties in ways that were challenging. And these were all acceptable to me. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't be acceptable to myself. Um, and this kind of led to a breakdown in my own ability to do any work. For a long time, well, for about a year, I became less and less able to actually physically work. I spent a lot of time writing. I spent a lot of time um, sitting in cafes, scribbling in notebooks, trying to figure out what the heck I was supposed to do with myself um, in order to be a functioning member of society and also be true to my own identity. Um, and at the same time, I thought, well, I'm, I've been enjoying architecture, but I also feel like I need something else. So. Um, I went and started a PhD in the history of architecture at the University of California at Berkeley. I'm still working on it. I started in 1998. My daughter, who was in kindergarten at the time, is now starting a master's program at Berkeley. <laughs> Maybe we'll graduate together. We'll see what happens. Um, but I'm looking at the development of commercial architecture and um, industry architecture for trade, specifically the East India Company in London. One of the great benefits of doing our uh, little academic work is that I was able to take a fellowship in London 2003, do some research, spend a lot of time in libraries, visiting sites. I've been back since to keep up that work because I just find it really invigorating for my brain. Um, part of the change of pace was also then to break from the laboratory and science and healthcare gig I was doing at Smith Group and look for other kinds of work to do. After working, after being at the university for a couple of years, I decided to start with Beverly Pryor Architects. I was hired as the lead designer for the firm, um, did a number of projects like this community center in Los Banos. Los Banos reminds me in some ways of um, Celeste. <laughs> it's a, in the terms of the uh, kinds of architecture that is generic there and then the kinds of ways you can work with it. Our choice here at this community center was to actually take that generic architecture and run as far as we could with it and creating a language that was up to date um, and to make the use of that language in a way that would be recognizable for the people there. Um, did some work in Los Angeles, getting a little googy here with the Los Angeles Long Beach Fire Station. Um, work in education projects, which I really enjoy. This is some actually modular buildings for Lawton Middle School in Cupertino. Um, and this was the last thing I did with BPA as we were purchased by HMC Architects out of Los Angeles. You'll see a thread here of firms combining, firms changing, firms uh, having to move from place to place. Um, project in Richmond for two schools on one site in the Iron Triangle, um, Greenfield Academy and Leadership Public Schools. Um, 
And the idea here, I guess circling back to my own educational experience is just to provide the highest quality physical environment I could, an environment that respected the students as opposed to expected them to destroy it. If I could respect people with the building, I figured they would treat it well. So far it's been rewarding. Um, I also try and throw in things that make something uh, banal into something exciting. In this case, this freeze of uh, dock perforations on this interior of a gymnasium. So at the end of all that, I was still in the closet. This was my, I, this was sort of my uh, business card at the end of it. But I was also a transgender woman and I couldn't resist this anymore. I needed to come out and I'd been doing a lot of therapy for years trying to figure this out and working with my spouse and working with my family and decided that had to happen. So uh, this is about five years old now. This is an article from the San Francisco Business Times, me sort of <laughs> coming out publicly um, after I'd been rehired at Smith Group. Um, where I'm currently working. Um, part of being out is, is having to be visible to other people so that I could see myself if I needed me. <laughs> um, being in the closet meant I was not available to anybody else as a resource. Um, being visible means somebody else can say there's options moving forward if they have to. Um, currently as trans, my rights to these essential aspects of citizenship are being contested. Um, as we all know, uh, currently, even during the COVID epidemic, different le state legislatures are opting to vote for th things to, uh, uh, to let, deny trans people rights in different states. Um, but funny thing is, is that none of this has really negatively affected me. And I guess you can probably figure it out why. Some of these slides are from another talk about intersectionality, but intersectionality is really the key here because in terms of the different ways that all of us are evaluated in society, um, so far, up to the point where I came out, where I was transitioned, I was the benefit of all sorts of privilege. And that privilege has allowed me to carry through, um, from, carry through experience from the time bef before I came out to the time afterwards. And I recognize now my point period in the closet was a period of, of um, self-preservation, of defense against a world that was not going to let me move ahead um, until I was ready to be, until I saw the world opening up enough, I couldn't make myself visible. Um, now I've been back with Smith Group. This is a couple of uh, slides of a project I just, just opened last year for um, Van Ness campus at Sutter CPMC. I was in charge of all the interior detailing on the project, so all the public lobby spaces. I took my uh, crazy sheet of wood details and I guess blew that up into a career here. Um, this is a labor and delivery room. This is the cafeteria. I still mean to go there and order a pizza from the beautiful red pizza oven. This is the intensive care unit ending on a COVID note. This is where a lot of patients now are, are currently uh, being taken care of. Um, healthcare is one of those industries that um, every action you make in it is actually related to the saving of lives or to the most difficult periods in anybody's existence. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a daunting, problem to be involved in healthcare projects. And it's quite a, quite a privilege. Um, finally, just I found that instead of being trans being my defining aspect, really it's more about all the other con connections that I can make with people. Um, and just to back, go back to my thesis, it seems like actually making architecture really was part of what I was interested in. Um, working in firms, working with people who had more experience than I did, learning from them, I took seriously the advice of Rafael Maneo when I was in school. He said, nobody is really a very good architect until they're 50. And I said, okay, I'm gonna keep learning <laughs> until I'm at least that old. And I can safely say now that I still am learning and have no idea what I'm doing, even though it looks like I do. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen and Charles. Um, so I think at this point, um, actually, I'm, I, I'm actually fine if, uh, why don't we, actually for the moment, Kathleen, why don't we let the, um, let the panelists be the screen. And uh, I think that brings them a little bit more into focus. Um, I think everybody knows that if they want to pin somebody on their screen while they're talking, you can do that by going to the upper right of their photo and make them their screen. But I think somehow that uh, seeing our faces and um, revealing 
the panelists um, is a way of bringing, kind of bringing this more personally together. Charles, I'm gonna invite you to uh, unmute. Um, and I just wanna, before I start asking questions, I just wanna thank you guys. I saw a lot in your presentations about, um, well, a lot of fearlessness, first of all. Fearlessness of revealing yourselves, fearlessness of going forth where perhaps no one else had done exactly what you had done in many ways. And then fearlessness in architecture and um, you know the use of sketching as a tool, the use of drawing to def uh, to um, to inquire, drawing as in inquiry, I think is something that's so important. And that you know that led to Helen getting into Harvard. That led to Charles being able to very simply communicate to his um, to his clients in Oregon and in Oakland. And it was actually the uh, subject of a um, of a Zoom lecture that we had in the school last Thursday. And I just want I really want students to see that at the end of the day, if te if technology fails us, we we should be sketching, we should be drawing, we should be communicating. Um, there was fearlessness in Charles uh, in your spreadsheets, in the idea that you take control through at least not being afraid of math, and fearlessness. <laughs> in um, Helen's sense of defining herself and being clear about what, uh, who she was a part of, where her communities were, where her strength and power had come from, um, and her decision-making process, so thank you. We also, in a sense, saw the history of the tools of our practice, as Paul Adams in our pro-practice uh, faculty calls it, the tools of practice. We see everything from, um, from drawing to the small construction uh, sets that sit on a project site for up to years. I love that, that, set, that set from um, one of your projects, Helen. Um, the tools of practice uh, going all the way up to 3D printing and looking at how materials are used, the tools of practice of thinking about the, um, our resources and where those resources are coming from and the use of offcuts and, and lumber and Oregon is just uh, kind of a, you know, a very, it, it's something that we talk about all the time, you know, how do we use something that's left over? And I, I think it's just really, it's going to become more and more important that we look at that knowledge set as something that we have power over. So, and then the intersections of, an, of vernacular architecture or the, of the architecture without architects is so important. So um, I thank you for all of that. Um, and so now my questions are really coming from um, coming from students, and you'll hear their voices, no doubt, because many of our students uh, have similar experiences um, of being other, or um, and and feeling like they're outside, or of um, coming from another culture and trying to figure out how does that culture, how does that overlay, represent who I am now, and what do I do with this information. Um, a lot of our students are coming from different places and now they've probably been in the United States maybe as long as they uh, spent, you know, their coming of age in the United States. So we are actually spending more time with students as, as adults than they spent in their country, their previous um, place as, as an adult. So that is really significant for them. So my first question comes from a student who asked, do you feel or have you felt external pressure to represent a legacy or demographic by your actions and by your presence in the public realm or in the profession? Do you feel something that's um, being pushed on you by others? Uh, I think I'm gonna start with Charles on that one, if you don't mind. Um, and you guys can jump in. I won't always call anybody, call you out. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily feel pressure from others, but I do, I think, have an internal pressure because I think for me, the current narrative for Native American um, populations is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe poverty or casinos or, or something, you know, that, you know, may not have a, a positive connotation. And I, and I think it's also somewhat of a suppressed population because uh, people, for the most part, don't hear much about Native American populations. So I think I'm trying to bring 
that culture and that identity to the forefront um, through um, the architecture um, that I um, that I design and create. Um, and by doing that, involving community members and involving the various uh, levels and uh, interactions of, of culture to express that architecture. So it's, uh, I think it's an internal pressure that, that I feel more so than an external. Ellen? Yeah, I'd say I do feel, I do feel some pressure um, from the community. Uh, just a couple of days ago was Trans Day of Visibility. I didn't know, <laughs> but tough time to be visible, but the, having to stay home. Um, and I, I believe in that. I believe in being visible at this point in my life where I have the luxury of being able to be visible. Um, I don't, I am in some ways the least uh, queer person, the least queer, queer person you're likely to meet. <laughs> I'm not very flamboyant. I'm not very obviously queer. I'm not very, um, uh, it's not where I center my identity, but I'm just trying to be myself and be still a re respectful, productive, humble, um, empowered person at the same time. And um, the narrative, the, fu the narrative around trans people, of course, is um, historical narrative has been either that trans people were murdered in movies or were the pervert who murdered somebody else. Um, trans people were um, sexual deviants, trans people were, um, still are a danger to children or to other women or to anybody. Um, and yet really it's trans people who are victimized and this narrative of people being dangerous when actually they're the victims applies both to the Native American community and to the black community and the trans community and to most minority communities in the United States. Um, and it's, it's, um, as I said, really in the presentation, it's important for me to be visible for whoever in my life needs to see somebody being visible, being out as themselves and being um, a good person in the world, doing good. That's my goal. Uh, I think both of you started to answer this question. It's a little bit of a follow-up question, but, um, and, and maybe we can look at it broadly. So the, the question is, do, uh, from the students, do you find the need that you have to edit yourself in the presence of others? How do you make choices when you allow yourself to be seen? I think um, perhaps we can even broaden this to say, you, your experiences lead, led you to have very strong opinions or at least led you to understand what your opinions are um, on how you lead your life and how others should. But there might be times when you don't necessarily feel like that um, is uh, something that's going to be received by others, right? Yeah. So I think um, perhaps uh, the question can be broadened to how do you navigate those moments when you are in the presence of others and you know that you're, you're, you're sort of trying to ride the difference between who you, what you feel you should be and say and present and what you think they can receive, shall we say, what yeah. they can hear. I can speak, Charles, if, unless you want to go first. But um, sure. I've, I, um, I'm, well, being not very, um, I, don't, I don't go on about myself a lot. I, am, I grew up, of course, as like the best secret keeper you know, you know, <laughs> because I kept a, I kept a pretty, difficult secret for a hugely long period of time. Um, and so I also developed a lot of defensive mechanisms that many of which I still are, auto, are still automatic for me today that um, are not easily overcome. And so my whole persona, my whole presence is not very um, in your face, let's put it that way. Um, and that means I can slip under all sorts of radars. Um, I don't think after spending more than two minutes with me, most people don't get that I'm trans if they have that on their, in their worldview. But um, I don't think it's not something that comes to bite me on a regular basis. So I'm not too terribly guarded about it, especially in this community. I should say that I spent you know, uh, three years on site at the hospital project, uh, working with contractors, working with laborers, working with um, engineers and the owner and all sorts of other people as an out trans woman. Um, and I never had one negative comment. I never had one problem with anybody. Um, partly it was the culture of that project. Partly it was the nature of San Francisco as a, as a welcoming place. 
Um, but that was surprising to me and I was afraid of it from day one, but it never happened. Um, but I do feel, I, I do know that I edit myself. I've edited myself my entire life and I, now I'm editing myself probably right now as I'm speaking to you, <laughs> trying to impress you with my greatness. Uh, we'll see, you know, but um, there's a lot of automatic stuff that goes on and I'm code switching and I'm sure somewhere deep in my head without me being aware of it. Um, coming to awareness of what I had to do was a very slow process for me. Still is. Thank you. Charles, what do you think? Yeah. I, I think for me, um, you know, in terms of navigating or ed editing yourself through, you know, different interactions, it, it really is similar to, I think, the way an architect functions. Like an architect um, needs to know a lot about, um, a, a little bit about a lot of things. Um, you know, whether you're interacting with the structure engineer or the city planner, whatever it is. And so I think for me, it's, it's just been continually expanding that role. So, uh, right, if I'm talking to uh, investors and things like that, the conversation might be different um, than, you know, if I'm talking to the community or talking to a city official. And it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like editing or, or changing who I am or my intention, but I think everybody has a different language and trying to communicate your intentions um, to, um, to various groups and various uh, people. So that way uh, you guys are speaking the same language. Um, so I guess that's what, what I try to do with, with all of my work is just, you know, the, all the different people that are part of the process and part of the project. Uh, as the architect, you have to be able to communicate that vision uh, clearly. And that, that's a, that bridging is a skill and a, and a power it's to say that architects only know a little about a lot. It makes it sound a little bit like we don't have a, a strength, but our strength is in doing that, is in making those kinds of connections. Um, and I think yeah. that we're uniquely situated to make the world, right? Because of that skill. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot to be discussed about that bridging. I hope you guys, maybe we can come back and expand on that um, because I think um, that bridge both professionally and personally is, is really important. Um, this is another uh, question um, that comes from students, and I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of them, and uh, because I think you can res you can find the place in which it makes most sense to respond. So the first question is: How is identity carried through aesthetics? If we go beyond program, beyond designing for basic needs and activities, we we develop something that is. Um, is our aesthetic or the aesthetic of the project that we're, team that we're part of? How how do we carry? It, is that does that tie to our identity? Charles has given some fairly specific answers to that, but if you take maybe now we take that into a, a different realm or a different culture, um, and then leading from that, how do you invite people from a different culture to see a different kind of beauty or aesthetic? one that may not be familiar or meaningful to them at first glance. I think embedded in those two questions are, again, a professional response of what we carry. So I don't know which one of you would want to launch into that. Could you Let's just see. repeat the first question again? Sure. How is identity carried through aesthetics? I think that's something you're, you're um, thesis takes on, right? Um, sure. But it, we, I think the students understand that when we provide a program space, a space for something to happen that's a part of our identity, that's one. But when we go beyond that, we actually create the identity of the space through design choices. Where might, where might the identity of the designer fall into that? Um, what do you think about that? And maybe how does your how does your thesis, Charles, carry into doing work in in Oakland, as an example? And how do you invite people from a different culture to then see an aesthetic that may not have initially had meaning for them? Particularly in Helen's case, she's designing for um, in civic spaces, and she's trying to essentially create inclusiveness. So how does aesthetics um, be, how is the aesthetics part of that message? 
I think it's, it's, there's a lot of things. Um, I've only become more aware of growing, you know, as I got older about how strongly the physical surroundings of your upbringing affect you. Um, the tactile qualities, the um, materials, how the materials are put together, how they affect your thinking and how they affect your, the movement of your body, how they affect um, where you're going to feel comfortable. And so I don't want to think of aesthetics here as only an intellectual category. I'd rather think of it as a very sort of uh, physically embodied one that I carry around as part of my physical awareness of the world as my sense of aesthetics. Um, and I know that's reflected in material choices I've made. Um, presence of wood in educational facilities. It's just like, okay, it's like, that's what has to be for me. <laughs> it has to have wood in it or else it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, I, um, I don't know in terms of how to make other people welcome. I had, two, I, I had two clients ask me this in quick succession once, how are we going to make everybody feel welcome in our buildings? How are we going to do that? Um, this was not a, maybe an answer for different cultures, but it was an answer for people who were living in a similar setting. Los Banos, properly pronounced Los Banos in the center of the state is um, a mix of uh, Anglo settlers and actually Sikh settlers and African-American settlers and also a lot of um, Latinx settlers. Um, and it's a, so people come from a very mixed background, also a lot of Portuguese people from the Azores. So it's got a, it's got a variety of folks, but they're all used to sort of the same sort of structural system that the plank houses suggested, which is long span wood, which is why long span wood, which is something everybody saw in their garage or in their church or in the, um, the inexpensive constructions of their surroundings, what we employed in the community center to say, we're going to use the same structural type something that's understandable to people and we're going to make it beautiful so that they could enjoy it and they could find richness in it. It wasn't beyond their reach. It was something that was in, within their reach. Um, for somebody coming from a very, very different background, I don't know how to, how to, how to bridge that exactly, except to say that um, there's basic techniques of openness and welcome that buildings can, can provide. Um, visibility, feelings of safety. Um, and I know that those also are very culturally determined. Some people like to skirt the edges. Some people like to be in the middle <laughs> of the space. And it's hard, to, uh, it's hard to design for everybody. I always end up putting something in that's very personal for me. as well, something that feels rewarding to me and very unexpected in order to jar people a bit so that um, I'm not only trying to make everybody comfortable, I'm also trying to make everybody equally uncomfortable. Um, instead of catering to one audience at the expense of the others, I'd like to have everybody have to challenge and question their presence a little bit. You're welcome, but you have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, um, and all of the work that I do, and uh, you had mentioned it before, I, I kind of uh, look at the vernacular or like what's happening locally to create that identity. So in the example of my thesis, the entire project became, becomes a dialogue about wood and the different ways to, to explore wood. And um, I didn't show any of our projects that we have in Oregon, but uh, for our projects that we have in Oregon, we are also looking at different ways of, of, of using wood, both on the interior and exterior, because it's such a red, readily available material uh, up there. And then I guess, for the Oakland projects, the way that we're looking at it, like, you know, if we're thinking about vernacular, it's like, okay, we live in the Bay Area, and this is a really high tech city. And, you know, maybe a lot of, uh, you know, the essence of vernacular architecture is, uh, you know, is being being lost. And so I think I also look at the users and the, the specificity of the program to define that. So in the example of Uncle Willie's Barbecue, um, uh, we're at the beginning stages of redesigning their restaurant. And so we are, um, for the facade, we're looking at using core 10 steel because it kind of has this burnt kind of barbecue uh, texture. And then on the inside, we're uh, going back and forth right now between using like a charred wood or um, an, an uncharred wood, uh, because wood has a big presence with barbecue. So that program is very specific, and the material and, and the way I guess that gets uh, represented is showing up there. But then for the housing above, 
it's it's tough to create a specificity for housing because we don't necessarily know who the occupants are going to be. And so I guess uh, in regards to housing and all, all of the housing that we're, we're doing, I think we're trying to find a way to create like architecture as a vehicle for people to live their own lives. And so it's not something where it's like brutalist where the architecture is overpowering and defines everything, but something that is open enough and flexible enough for, you know, people to do whatever they want with the space. If they want to paint it pink or red or blue or whatever, and have, you know, all sorts of carpets, it's like that, that's my favorite when I see people occupying and inhabiting uh, the space in their own way. So uh, that's, I think for me, two uh, different ways of how, um, identity can, can get um, executed or displayed through aesthetic. I've always, I got to say, I've always been drawn to brutalism. I spent a lot of time in Paul Rudolph's art and architecture building at Yale and also in Colin McKillen Woods gym at Exeter, both quite brutalist structures. And I always loved the buildings because they honestly just didn't care about you. <laughs> you didn't have to, be, they didn't expect anything of you. They expected the worst. You could be whatever and it really building really didn't care. So. Part of part of the anonymity, right? One yes, can be exactly. anonymous in a <laughs> building that takes on such identity that one's focus goes up and out. Right. Very, <laughs> That's very true. Um, well, I want to open this up to questions from students, and um, in order to do that, I'm going to kick. I'm going to uh, launch with the uh, the last question from my from my list, and that is just simply. Do you have suggestions for students? Do you have something that you would pass on, um, especially if you think about what they would focus on in school and what they would focus on as they leave school? Um, and this is a really critical time. It's very tough to answer that question, I think, but, um, but I would include in that the fact that there's, there's, a lot in, there's a lot of wisdom in looking back and seeing what tools you draw from or where, where you draw your strengths from, um, mm -hmm. from your academics and from your early years of practice. And, and while you think about that, I'm simply gonna um, say to, stu to the students and the faculty who are online and on the webinar, please type in your questions um, and we'll be tracking them. Helen, I, could, Charles, I, could, I could speak for a second, um, I think there's a lot of rushing about as a student. Um, there's a lot of uh, rushing to meet deadlines and rushing to satisfy other people's expectations. Once you're into a program, suddenly you're met with huge demands. And um, after a while, it's possible for your own sense of self to vanish in that um, as you meet other people's expectations. Um, it's important and it was important for me and still is to carve out some time to say, actually, me caring for myself is important. <laughs> I need to figure that out some time for it, first of all. And secondly, who am I and what do I want? Um, that really affects every stage of your career, is asking clearly, who am I and what do I want? And not just in a sort of mental thing, what's, what do I think my teachers want me to want, but what do I actually want in the world? Um, what do my parents want me to want? I kind of gave that up a long time ago, <laughs> I had to. Um, and um, for you to be okay means for you to be responsive to yourself and your own needs. And um, that doesn't matter. It, it certainly should happen while you're in school. It's, you'll never have the clarity ever that you need always to be true perfectly. So just do your best, but do make time for it and don't just um, go forward with what you think other people want from you. Make sure you're up to it, make sure you want it, make sure that there isn't something else you'd rather be pursuing. Um, our two careers are very different in terms of being an independent practitioner or somebody who's on their own versus my own career, which has been very much working for other people. Um, that's had its benefits, but it's also meant some limitations. I've never liked working on my own, I get too lonely. I get too uh, full of doubts. I like working with other people. So that was just something I learned about myself was that I'd like to be in an environment with a lot of other people with expertise where I can learn. Um, and that's been, that's been good for me. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Charles. Yeah. 
I, I agree with you completely, Helen. And I, I think, you know, just kind of thinking about my own architectural education, you, as an architecture student, you begin to take on the role of an architect or an architecture student, and you become embedded in uh, the culture of architecture, staying up late, meeting deadlines, um, you know, and uh, taking on a new language to describe the way you uh, see the world and, and describe projects. And, um, you know, by taking on this new architecture culture, um, you can definitely forget about, you know, your previous uh, culture or identity uh, about where you come from. And I, I think, uh, especially as you get into your upper studios or any type of final project or thesis project, trying to find that dialogue between um, who you are, who you were before architecture, and, um, you know, how, how you've grown uh, becoming uh, an architecture student, you know, is there a relationship between uh, those two things? Do you want a relationship? Do you not want a relationship between those? Um, but I think being, being aware of it, um, so that way you can impart your own, um, I guess, your, your own um, identity onto the profession. Or onto some other profession, if that's where it takes you. <laughs> it's like, this is a yeah, still, yeah, exactly. I, and for most, most of you are undergraduates, I did not <clears throat> decide to become an architect until my senior year of college. Um, there could be a change in store for you in the future. Thank yeah. you. So I think we have uh, some students ready to ask questions. I think we even have one who um, wants to speak to the panelists. Um, so Kathleen, I think you're ready to turn on Juan Okana um, has a question. And then uh, I'm going to let Karen take over from there. So first Juan, Juan will ask his question and then I'm going to turn it over to Karen Song to craft other questions after Juan is done. Hi Juan, welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you for um, presenting. It's a, been a very interesting um, seminar to, to listen to both of your uh, careers and, and how they've uh, tran transgressed. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to throw something out from my personal experience. I'm, I'm Hispanic. Um, I've been working in the field as a drafter um, and I'm in, at Academy of Art University to, to complete my uh, well, career as a, as a, to get to the level of becoming an architect. And, uh, you know, what I found was that um, yeah, I recently I, I, started working for a firm with um, two other Hispanic uh, individuals, and I found a sense of community there. Um, and I think that now that we're in a different scenario, um, perhaps, you know, looking at seeking out um, people in your community, in the architecture community, um, online is probably... Uh, something that would be really beneficial for all of us. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And then my actual question is um, uh, for Helen or Charles, either of you could probably speak on this, is going from that drafting to design. Um, you know, Helen spoke that even after all of your years in school and, uh, you know, you were drafting, you know, for, for quite a while until you took that notice. And, and it seems like that's a challenge, you know, that I see in our profession. So, um, and then Charles might have a different uh, perspective on that. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Carol, I guess I'll, I'll talk for a second. Um, thank you, Juan. It's nice to meet you. Um, I know drafting is something that um, some offices have people who do drafting and some people don't. Some offices don't. Um, I've always felt that people who are, anytime you put a pencil on the paper you're designing, first of all, and um, that your design hat has to be on. So it's a, um, I, hate to, I hate almost to hear the word drafting in terms of architecture because it's not really ever what we're doing. We're always designing something. Um, but I know also that it's a long process. Um, as it, considering it took me until almost age 50 to come out as trans, I'm a pretty patient person. So I got along with the idea of um, learning architecture as being something that's going to take me some time. And I was okay coming out of school and spending a couple of years um, still drafting. 
I was okay recognizing that when I was given a um, interior elevation to draw, um, I knew that there were things that had to be added to it and I would ask all these questions trying to say, well, how am I doing this right? Am I getting, am I getting a design idea here that's of interest? Um, and work very clear, very tightly with people trying to extract as much information as I could from them about um, how to move ahead. Um, I don't, I don't know how the recognition came that, you know, I was trying, that I was going to do something, that what I was doing was worth following in terms of design, that I could be given design a task, except that they were always kind of growing out of everything I was touching, because that's how the office was organized, that every task became a design problem. Um, and I would suggest, and maybe this isn't quite what anybody wants to hear, is that if you're being told that all you're good for is drafting, you should find a different job if it's possible, um, that where you can extend, ex spread your wings a little bit. Um, it's not a, you shouldn't be anybody else's mouthpiece. You should start to have your own voice. Yeah, I, hi Juan, um, thank you for the question. I, I second what Helen has said. And I think, you know, for me, like it's, it's, it's a valuable experience learning how to do drawings. And as Helen mentioned, and I agree, like, I think when we're drafting or drawing, there is always inherent design decisions that you're making about that. Um, in my particular case, when I was um, working um, for Stanley Sadowitz in San Francisco, I, I did a lot of drafting or, or drawing, um, probably similar to yourself. And I think as I began to, um, I guess, increase my technical knowledge about things and I, and I gained more confidence about what I was drawing and the design decisions I was making, I think I started to maybe push the limits a little bit and say like, oh, well, I did this because of this, or, or what if we did this? And so you start to, you know, push and, and, and kind of create your own, I guess, design language and, and see how, um, you know, your, your mentors or, or your boss react to it. And then you can maybe start to begin to take on more of a role as a, you know, designer, but also still have the drawing uh, capabilities. Um, so, I think, yeah, as you continue to go through your, your design education, see how that can um, start to be embedded in the work that you're doing uh, with, with uh, you know, your, your firm that you're at. And uh, as Helen mentioned, if there's an opportunity to go somewhere else and spread your wings, like uh, that's great. Or maybe you use your design skills to push yourself to uh, another, another level. I, I still, you know, I don't have uh, as, as much experience as Helen and I don't have, uh, uh, you know, 50 years of technical experience. And so there's, there's always levels to learn. I, I learn every day. And um, yeah, so, so just continue to put, push yourself and, and just be always open to, to learning things. Yeah, yeah. It does, it does, adding that additional ingredient, whenever you are working on something, I think you're right, Charles, about seeing it as an opportunity to add something to it, or even to most times, your boss isn't too isn't that carefully watching your hours. Make sure that you're, you know, throwing in something here and there as a little additional study, and say this is something I thought might work. What do you think? Yeah, they'd appreciate the initiative. Thank you both very helpful? much. Is that at all helpful? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, very much so. Thank you both. Thank you, Juan. Karen, uh, do you want to unmute and share with us? Uh, some of the other questions you're seeing? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have a question from Shadi. Um, she's interested in um, hearing your thoughts um, about the, the, the tools, you know, um, design and production tools of hand drawings versus digital software. Yeah. The, um, the amount of time, um, the experience. Um, so her question is, uh, what do you think has been lost or could be lost? How did you find the transition between uh, you know doing hand drawings or manual drawings um, and convert uh, and transitioning into uh, using digital digital tools primarily. Yeah. So what are the pros and cons of either using either tool now that you know one hand drawing used to be more dominant in the past and nowadays digital tools, especially for our students who are you know entering as um, in, into the junior positions, you know they're finding a lot of the emphasis on in acquiring digital tools. So if you could speak to that. Um, I'd say, first of all, that 
there's a large part of the industry of the AEC industry that is moving towards more and more integration of digital tools. So um, we are being asked to deliver not just drawings, but models um, to contractors. And depending upon how our contracting arrangements are, um, we're still having to do drawings for um, cities and state to review. Um, drawings aren't going away anytime soon. Um, how we produce them is, has changed, obviously, but the digital modeling is something that's really here to stay and it's, gonna, it's going to be part of our lives. Um, I think that varies, though, with the kind of project you're working on and whether contractors are able to take advantage of it or your builder or yourself <laughs> in your own life if you're building something, whether you want it. And it, it's never going to... Um, the, the digital tool isn't where the ideas come from. The ideas aren't coming only from... The, I'll take that back. My daughter has married somebody who's doing a lot of digital work. He's a math, he's a sort of math and CS person. So he knows a lot about computer science and he's generating forms purely with computer science, but he's looking at them then in 3D and saying, do I like them or not? Um, there's an aesthetic quality of what you see and your connection of your hand to your eye that still matters a great deal. And so I'm still drawing constantly on these, uh, these are 12 by 12 pads from <laughs> that I use. And I do details on these and I hand them off to people and I do sketches on them. Um, and I'm aware of how much is lost by trying to squeeze everything through this little mouse, right? Every hand motion, every design idea becomes this tiny little jerk of the, of the hand and your bodily, your ability to express with your body is lost. Um, but we know that that's how people move through space. It's not, we're not moving in these vectors, we're moving as bodies. And um, I feel a lot can be lost if you rely only on the mouse as your drafting tool. So there's a constant play back and forth between the hand and the eye and the seeing and the sketching and the documenting and the modeling that goes in circles um, where each where you can use each tool at, its, at the right time. It's not like we've lost hand drawing. It's just been, we've added a tool to it. I still use tracing paper and I get out the mayline with a, fairly regularly to redo pieces of buildings that require a different set of thinking tools, um, different ways of seeing things that I grew up with that were maybe easier to, or where I could lose some of the concreteness of the digital line and become more abstract um, and start to see relationships more clearly. So there's, there's reasons to use all of them. And um, I wouldn't be afraid to take every tool that's at your, <laughs> at your you know, that you have, whether it's knitting or carving it out of wood or building out of mud or whatever. I mean, all those tools are of use for us here. Learning it was hard. <laughs> but it's been useful to have. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I definitely second that. And um, you know, I think uh, um, Zach Mead uh, touched on this last week in, in his talk, and he said that uh, you know these are all just tools in, in your in your tool bucket, and you know you have to know I think when and how to use all these various tools. Uh, depending on the result that you need. So like for us, like all of our projects in terms of construction documents and, and production, we're using Revit, but they definitely don't start off there. Um, I'll, I'll do hand sketches uh, as you saw in some of my slides. Um, a lot of, uh, I, I work with four other people in my office and um, we're, we're working in Rhino a lot of the times. Sometimes we're even working in AutoCAD to you know, get quick two-dimensional, either sectional or plan ideas out. And um, I think just trying to be as well versed in as many different um, to, uh, in, with as many different tools as you can, can will will really help you uh, in the future. Like a lot of the times, I might do a sketch about uh, a plan idea or how I want the elevation of a building to look, and then someone in my office will like take that sketch and they'll do either their own sketch or they might make a Rhino model and they'll come up with something way better than I had. So it's, it's, it's really, I think, you know, trying to understand as many different tools as you can and what, you know, when and where to use them. Yeah. Don't let your hand go. Don't let the drawing go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, we have a second question, this time from Samina. Um, about uh, uh, the, her question is on the journey of self-awareness of difference. Um, the question is, how focused are you at race-defying, gender-defying, connective identity? I'm curious how this expresses itself in your work and architectural language. Hmm. 
And I don't know if Samina one more time can unmute herself, but Samina, feel free to type in follow up questions in the chat if you would like. I think that question was from Sanita Takapali. Takalapali. Oh, sorry, I, th I thought I read <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Could you repeat the question? I guess Charles had asked Karen if you could repeat it. Yeah, I can. Um, so how um, how focused are you on race defying, gender defying, connective identity? I'm curious how this expresses itself in your work slash architectural language. I think she. I think so. She did use these words: um, it becoming aware of your differences. Um, um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, putting the course, <laughs> her question into my own words. But so, you know, how does this awareness of difference, you know, play into your work? I feel like it's always offered a sense of possibility, <clears throat> or a slightly outsider perspective that said. Okay, there's different ways to look at this thing here. There's different ways to understand what we're doing. There's different ways to analyze this problem other than the ways that have been suggested before or that I've seen before. Um, as a trans person, I can't exactly say that there's a trans technology or a trans um, or a particular trans culture because there's so many different trans people in all, in all cultures um, and living in all places. Um, but it's, it's offered me the sense of like, always being able to take a step back, at least one step back. I may not get far enough back. I think Charles, maybe you're getting farther back than I am. I think that's a good thing. But um, to take several steps back and say, what is going on here and how can I remake it? Um, I don't know. I've also been very good at fitting in. So uh, I sometimes not been so great at stepping back. And that fitting in, like I said, um, was defensive, so. Uh, I think for me, I, I can't really answer the, the gender define, um, but in terms of race define, uh, I think hopefully a lot of the students were able to see how um, an idea about race can be executed in uh, a project such as my thesis. But with regards to all of our projects, especially the Oakland projects, I'm working with uh, a majority uh, African American uh, community members and, and property owners uh, for those projects. And I don't know uh, very much uh, about that culture or about that identity. And so for as, a, as an architect, it's really about asking questions and understanding like, what are your needs? What are your wants? Like, what, what do they want to see? Because there's the kind of top down approach to architecture where you say, I, I want to, you know, I want everyone to see my grand design, or there's the more, I think, uh, communal or user approach to design where you're really trying to pull uh, as much information as you can together to uh, deliver the best possible uh, architecture to, to whoever it's for. I know that I always find those kinds of projects more satisfying where I'm able to have contact with the users or the community that's involved. Some clients won't let you um, and it's bizarre. And some clients are, have huge amounts of input and it always feels like a much more um, grounded, satisfying project for everybody concerned when you're able to take in that input and form decisions together. Thank you. Uh, so next we have a uh, um, Stefan who we Kathleen is going to turn his mic on shortly so we can ask his question. Hello. Hello, Stefan. Oh, well, hello, Helen and Charles. I wanted to thank you both for sharing. It's very informative, and I um kind of hopping in and off lunch break here while I'm working. We're working from home. So really quick, Helen, I wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, I do come from a more Christian based society. And if you have heard anything other than love, I really do apologize because that is the biggest thing that we stand for. So I thank you for sharing and I thank you for who you are as well. And um, Charles, your work with um, helping, helping the people, I kind of noticed that your, your true art is in like, I guess architecture I'm learning is more about understanding people and then meeting their needs. I kind of started it off like 
I enjoyed, I enjoyed designing, but then it, it like really fast was about, it's not really about what you enjoy doing. It's like matching what people like and then forming into it. So my question with that, I have one of the best professors ever, uh, Peter Engrell at the Academy of Art. He's been so helpful in um, helping me, but is it more about sketching in the beginning aspect or is it more about studying design principles? Because I'm kind of getting stuck between the two of like, am I taking too much time on one or should I be taking more time on the other? Are you asking about in the beginnings of, a, of an assigned project? Is that the question or I just in general? Yeah, in the career itself. Stefan, I think you're a first year student. I'm going yeah. to just give a little context for okay. you. So I think the question actually comes from the academic side as you build a foundation. Yeah, I think learning to see is one of the first things um, that I, I learned a lot, as I said, the, from this from architectural history classes, you know, being taught by people who knew what they were looking at or had looked at things a lot more, <laughs> a lot more than I had, um, what they were finding interesting. Um, and so learning about that method of looking at the world and, and identifying patterns in it that relate to how people live, um, how society works, how industry comes together, how people come together to make things, how different techniques for making things, whether it's weaving or nailing together or breaking things into pieces or building them up gently. Those are all different habits and ways of being that, are, that you can see in the world through architecture. And the, um, the, after learning somewhat from the feet of other people about or how, to, you know, how do they see the world? How do they see buildings? How do I start to interpret the environment around me? Starting to do it for yourself you know, through sketching, through uh, visiting, through looking at places, um, um, through visiting and, and, and learning from people about where they live and being very curious about it. Um, at the same time, only studying isn't going to get you an answer. It's, it's going, to be, or going to tell you who you are as a designer, but starting to make things and think deeply about your own reasons for, make, for drawing a line or for drawing a a space like you're, you're creating. Why am I doing it this way? Could it be otherwise? Would I want it to be otherwise? Um, what is it like in the world once I've made it? Um, those are all questions to be asked and they sometimes can seem like an impossible burden, like there's too many questions, but also sometimes you just have to break the questions and throw them away and say, I'm going to do what I want. And then later on, ask yourself why you wanted it. Um, I think there's I think the looking and the learning is the first thing for me anyway, that's what I experienced was the looking and the learning and then the trying to find my own voice in, in what I was seeing and then trying to make things that reflected that voice. Yeah, um, Stefan, I, I, um, I think it's a mix of both, understanding um, certain design principles, but continually practicing sketching, both by hand, uh, you know, and the various uh, digital programs. Uh, can can really help um, you know pu push you forward as as an architecture student. Um, I agree with what Helen said in terms of seeing it was making me think about my own architectural education. And I remember my first studio, the the professor took two chairs, turned one upside down, and said, "Draw the space of the chairs." And I, I think understanding how to draw space, and then as you go through your your, your education in your studios, understanding how I guess in more detail to define that space. Is it tectonic? Is it stereotonic? Uh, and, and all of the different, I guess, languages to, to represent that. Um, so, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take any of your other classes lightly, architecture history, architecture theory, all of those classes are, are really important because they'll, they'll provide a lot of examples of how uh, other architects have, have done things. Um, and then integrating, you know, things that you learn from that into your design studio and into your own kind of sketching and, and ideas about architecture uh, will, will really help you a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I have um, two more questions. The one is from Ernesto and the second one is from Juke. Um, so question from Ernesto. This question is directed more towards Charles, but all responses are appreciated. 
Is there any advice you would give your younger self when you first went on to do your own practice? Anything you would do differently or wish you knew beforehand? Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Me, um, I think the I think when I had left um, working for Stanley Sadowitz, I in a lot of ways I felt like I didn't I wasn't ready I didn't have um, enough technical knowledge or maybe I didn't have enough uh, projects and um, I, I think I could always benefit from from more of of that um, but I think. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do anything differently. I, I would, uh, you know, just so everyone knows. It's like I feel, you know, I'm continuously learning. I, I go through different uh, success and failures every, every day. Um, but I think the main thing is to just continue, always pushing forward, and, and continue, um, continue to to learn. Um, yeah. And Helen, would you yeah. like to add anything to about? You know, comparing um, what you what students are asked to learn in right. academia versus in practice. Um, you'll get a lot of disdain from people in practice sometimes coming out of school saying you don't know what you're doing. And to some extent, you should push against it. And you say, actually, I've learned a lot. And to some extent, you should accept it that some of it's true. There's an awful lot of technical stuff to learn. Um, one shouldn't expect, and a lot of practitioners want schools to teach students everything they need to know in order to be good practitioners right away. It's like, no, it just is impossible. Um, literally, it took me a, several decades to be able to stand up in a meeting and feel like I could say something that was actually of value. I think it's, um, most people are faster than that, don't worry. <laughs> so, but I think it's, it's, um, it, is, it is a long art. It is a long skill to learn. Um, it is important that you find something that um, excites you about it. And I think Charles is a really great, shows a great example of how to take um, an interest and make it into a power, and make it into something that no other, nobody else is really doing. Um, and if you can find that, that's great. If at the same time, or if you feel like, you know, I really don't know what I want to do. I know I need to learn. I want to work with people. Um, take that and, um, Try and find the best people you can work with that you can, and just as learn as much as you can. Um, it's not a everybody, and and even once you're in practice, there's so many different flavors of architect. The fact that I'm mostly I'm doing sort of technical guidance right now is a surprise to me. <laughs> mostly, I thought I'd be in design or following somebody else's orders, but here I am uh, providing guidance, and that's great. But at the same time. Um, people who are moving into project management, people who move mostly into marketing, people who move mostly into um, uh, working on site and construction administration. There's all sorts of different skills that this profession needs. And one of the things that you come out of architecture school thinking is you have to be everything to all people as an architect. And actually there's a room, room for lots of different kinds of people in a firm, in the practice, because there's so many different niches to fill and they take so much expertise to, to do well. So. Yeah, very true. Okay, and then this question is from Juke. Um, how do you come to terms with projects that's meant to bring in money more than gathering or keeping marginalized communities, um, you know, offering something to the marginalized communities if you've worked on one? So how to balance social good versus um, making an income or uh, profitable projects? I, my answer to that is maybe a little harder because I'm always working on people's, I'm working for other people doing their, doing their, uh, their needs. Um, I haven't worked for developers except for once. I worked on a project that was going to be in Kuala Lumpur. It was a joint venture with HOK. Um, and it was a, a um, shopping center and five giant office towers that were going to be built on top of the park where uh, uh, independence was declared in KL. And apparently this was the main community garden or community park for the Chinese community in Kuala Lumpur. Of course, this was where the government was going to drop a big, <laughs> allow, a, allow a developer to destroy the community basically. Um, I worked on that remotely here in San Francisco. Once I found out about it, I asked to be removed from the project. Um, I 
have really tried to work only on projects that have had some identifiable for me public goal. Development of knowledge is for me a public goal, a public good. Um, marginalized communities have been harder for me to meet because the so many of the projects I've worked on have been institutional and marginalized communities have had a long history of being sidelined by institutions, um, universities, uh, healthcare institutions. Working at the hospital in Van Ness, I, I also spent time um, providing free planning and got a lot of construction materials donated and time donated to a local clinic for the sex workers in the Tenderloin. Um, so that was one way of trying to give back to this, to the community that we were effectively starting to displace. Um, that project is built right adjacent to the, you know, the most transient and uh, difficult, one of the most uh, beset communities in, the, in San Francisco. And um, I felt it was important that we be giving something from that effort back to that community. It wasn't enough. It's not going to be enough. Capitalism sucks. Um, but I think Charles is onto something in terms of empowering people with their own, with their own powers, with their own tools. Um, yeah, for me, I have a very specific uh, view on this with the, the project and the work that I'm that I'm uh, doing. Um, and, and I think for me, it maybe comes out of, um, as I had mentioned, I've, I've worked for a lot of real estate developers or clients that are very driven by by money. And um, it's tough to, you know, create and have intention with um, you know, the, with architecture, especially related to gathering and, and community, um, if you're, if, you know, the, the, the client or the person leading the project is, is only for money. And so I think, yeah, as part of my architect toolbox, I think that's why I've taken on spreadsheets and, and math and finances as a way to try to understand how can I control that aspect to better the gathering and, and community aspect of it. Um, and, and it's, it's really tough because there's, um, you know, you're, you're trying to meet the needs of so many different individuals. Um, but I think a, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing in terms of presentations and interacting with the community is trying to teach them about, uh, how money works relative to real estate development. And through that, then, uh, being uh, able to execute architecture, uh, that allows people to stay in their communities and, um, they, yeah, stay in the places they love. Okay, and then I have, I have a question. Um, do we have time for one more question? Uh, yes, go ahead. I have a question from Ramona. Um, I have to kind of, I'll just read it as she typed it, and then we can kind of try to figure out, dissect it a little bit. There's a lot there. Um, so she wrote, after learning about intersectionalities and different identities of the world, how do I bring these knowledge and ideas in my country, she's from Rwanda, by the way, through architecture, that is, uh, especially when the communities are not used to these ideas that she's been exposed to, um, are, you know, they're, they're not used to it or even opposed to it. So how do you bring in new ideas into her into her home country uh, when the audience is not ready for it or opposed to it. I'm not sure if you're able um, to like some of your experiences to a similar situation. Um, I, I think uh, for me, I, I had, uh, I think I briefly mentioned before, but uh, for me, it's kind of, it's uh, in some ways an issue of, of language. Uh, if you have, all of this architectural knowledge and, and these ideas about architecture that you know can benefit, uh, you know, the community and the country uh, that you're from, somehow being able to translate that language into something that, um, you know, the, the people where you're from can understand um, to, to, I think, execute what you want uh, will, will, um, is, is what you could try to do. I'm just thinking of it like, you know, with architects and design, like people might not know or, or have the vision that you have. And I think, you know, through all the different tools and, and, and techniques that we have, if, if you can somehow get people to understand and buy into the, the concepts that, that, um, that you're trying to explore both visually and verbally, um, that might be one way to, I guess, uh, get more community buy-in or, or um, 
not have them oppose your ideas. I think um, I came at this from a little different angle. I feel like the um, the question of oppression and of how uh, different groups and societies are valued or oppressed by that society is something that is to a large extent beyond design. Um, I am, you can work to make sure that your projects do not participate in that in any overt way, but how somebody is going to be treated in that building by other people based on their ethnic origin or their gender or their age or the color of their skin, these are things that are not up to you to be able to control. Um, the, I have not faced the kinds of quest, that kind of question in anywhere near the weight, with any near, near the weight that I expect the uh, questioner is bringing to it. Um, in this country, it has been, um, well, I can back up. I mean, certainly every institution I've been involved with has history of race oppression, has history of gender issues within it. Whether our architecture has done anything to help, I don't know. I know that we have people currently working in our education group, um, thinking about how buildings can provide the amenities that student that people need if they don't have them outside of the community, outside of the classroom building. These are for college students, many of whom are not housed, many of them are living in cars. They need places not only to go to class, but they need a place to keep their lunch. They need a place to maybe take a shower. <laughs> These are building things that can be added as amenities to projects that that empower people who would otherwise not be able to take to use the building um, or take or actually to get an education. Um, but I don't, I mean, it, there's the, I'm not even sure if it's true anymore, but the anecdote that I recall is that the, uh, the German SS, the stormtroopers for Hitler, apparently operated out of a glass skyscraper in Berlin. That this was, this is, it, it's not necessarily even if it's, even doesn't matter if it's accurate or not, but you know that good and bad can happen regardless of the design quality of a building. Um, and that there's a lot more to maybe in the building community and the way you go about the design process, the kinds of voices you listen to and empower in that and maybe can encourage communication would be more um, would be where the power would come as opposed to actually the aesthetics of the project or the actual design of the building when it's done. It's like, how do I make a community value itself better by the way I behave within it and the kinds of questions I ask? Um, I don't know. That's a really hard problem. Thank you, Helen. I, I think we've come from a, a place of, of detail and drawing and skill all the way up to these bigger existential problems that we all look at as we face the future. And I appreciate Ramona's question. Um, Absolutely. You know, I think at a certain point we have to be citizens. We have to um, take our power from the um, from the structure. We have to vote. We have to participate. Um, we live. We in the United States live in a democracy that allows us to participate yeah. in broad ways. Not all countries have that. If you have an opportunity and you feel safe um, or you feel that you can take a risk, then I think that participation can happen at many levels. Um, I, d I feel like time is, is ticking and yet all, we've kind of come to this really important place. So I'm going to simply um, ask uh, Helen and Charles to not think too hard about my last question. Um, but in the time that we are now, I think the word resilience comes to, to mind. Resilience, if we think of it as adaptation, uh, resilience is um, recognizing when we need a different solution, when we have to sort of think broadly. And I'm wondering if, when I say that word resilience, if there's an image or a moment in your life that you come to where you realize that wasn't necessarily comfortable or easy or at the time memorable, but now I understand that moment gave me resilience. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, coming out at all, I expected the, uh, I describe it as wasp hell. So my mother described if I was going to come out, it would be, I'd be in the gutter, I'd have no family, I'd have no money, I'd have no, I'd have no job. Um, luckily, none of that came to pass, um, and 
I'd always been fairly vocal about my architectural opinions, um, but being able to be more vocal about myself was what uh, proved to me that um, I had a backdrop to fall upon, that I had, I had family and friends who would value me regardless. Um, and so the resilience there was both personal in terms of knowing that I had the strength to do it, but also recognizing the support structure I did have that I never trusted before. Um, so. Thank you. Um, for me, it's, um, you know, it, it might be a, a little dark, but like I, um, I think growing up uh, in somewhat like more poverty or poor conditions and also growing up in some abusive uh, conditions, I think being, uh, I remember being a little kid and, you know, not really enjoying that at all. And I just knew that, you know, I, was, I kept saying like, well, one day, like when I'm older, like when I'm out on my own, like I'm going to like do what I want. Um, and, and I'm going to, you know, have a, I'm going to create a good life for myself. And right. Eventually you make, you make it through and you, you grow up and, and then you can control and, and, or hopefully control and create your, your own future and life that you want. And, um, so yeah, I guess for me, that was the moment that I, uh, realized like, yeah, if I can get to this, I can, I can make it through a lot of things. It's a beautiful answer. Um, and again, it takes some fearlessness and vulnerability to reveal that, which is perhaps meant to be a secret, but I think it's important. We all need to f pull from our experiences to become resilient and take on what's, what we're about to experience, um, in the next few months. So I just want to thank both of you. I think this has been a uh, really amazing discussion. Um, I wish it could go on farther because both of you have tied into um, different things that I would love to discuss in different studios with different students. Um, I want to thank the students who spoke up and I want to um, really appreciate students because we've had students speaking up from fourth year and first year online and on-site students, formerly on-site students. Um, it's been a very diverse uh, group of people who um, added their thoughts. And so, I, and thank you, Karen, for your last minute support in this. Um, I wish you all to stay healthy, to stay six feet apart, wash your hands, um, stay positive. Um, when you're not positive, take a moment, take a break, renew your strength and whatever you need to do and come back because resilience is gonna be our requirement for the next uh, foreseeable future. And Helen and Charles, there's no doubt that the communities you serve are gonna um, benefit from your strengths and your truthfulness and your observations and your experience. So thank you for your contributions today and moving forward. Wonderful to be here and I have thank all the you. great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Karen, Kathleen. Thank you to all the students for attending. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks.